Today we are pleased to introduce Robert Birmingham as part of the Wisconsin Historical Museum's History Sandwiched In Lecture Series. The opinions expressed today are those of the presenters and are not necessarily those of the Wisconsin Historical Society or the museum's employees. Robert Birmingham is the former Wisconsin State Archaeologist at the Wisconsin Historical Society and the author and editor of many publications on Wisconsin archaeology. He attended the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee for his undergraduate and graduate school training, and he's conducted fieldwork throughout the state. Here today to discuss the lineage and future, um, oh, sorry about that, <laughs> here to discuss Skunk Hill, a native ceremonial community in Wisconsin, please join me in welcoming Robert Birmingham. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having me um, to talk about my new book, um, uh, Skunk Hill, a, a Native Ceremonial Community in Wisconsin, although I've, re, uh, I've retitled the book for this presentation, and it's, since the book is not out yet, maybe we can use it. But the, um, uh, just to give some context here, a Native Ceremonial Community of the Great Repression, um, because the book deals with this Native American village uh, in the center of Wisconsin that was occupied between about 1905 and, and 1930. Uh, but this was during a time uh, of uh, fierce repression of Native people uh, between 1870s and 1930s. Uh, it was illegal for Native people to practice their religion on reservations or to speak their native languages. In order to force native people to assimilate into the broader American culture. This was the time, I'm sure many of you have heard, where children were taken away from parents and sent to special boarding schools. I mean, there are people alive today, native people, who spent their childhoods in Indian schools and were punished for anything they did that was, quote, Indian, you know. Um, and so that's the context here, and yet we have a community in Wisconsin uh, that was in fact founded so that people had the freedom to speak their language and to pursue their traditions, especially one particular kind of ceremonial, uh, without interference um, uh, of, the, of the federal government. And this is a place um, uh, called Skunk Hill. Actually, the native term uh, for it was Tukwakik, meaning Skunk, skunk Hill. Um, here is a, a 1910 photograph of, of the community. Um, and before I get into describing the significance of this community, uh, let me just tell you a little bit about how I came to write this book. Um, I have been around for an awful long time and have, uh, have been involved in many interesting things uh, during my career. Um, among the earliest researchers, in fact, I did, uh, were involved other ceremonial communities that are related uh, to Skunk Hill uh, up in northwestern Wisconsin. Same people um, and so on. And, and so I became intrigued already 30 years ago with these off-reservation communities that were specifically founded so that people could pursue their traditional ways in the 20th century. Um, but in, uh, as state archaeologist, uh, about 15 years ago, I became involved in a controversy uh, involving this place, uh, Skunk Hill. Uh, Skunk Hill uh, was a community um, occupied between 1905 and 1930 by mainly people who came from Kansas. These people were Wisconsin, or I should say the descendants of Wisconsin Potawatomi who had been removed to a Kansas reservation. And then because of all this repression and pressure, took a train <laughs> back to Wisconsin and founded Skunk Hill. Um, about 80 people uh, in, in general. Um, the, the village was placed on a big prominent knoll called Powers Bluff. In fact, I think it's the second highest elevation uh, in Wisconsin. Pretty, pretty remarkable. 
Um, after the native people left in, in the 1930s, um, it, it uh, became a uh, county park, very, very popular county park. And <clears throat> a part of this county park was on the north end of the park, uh, they put um, sledding hills, ski hills, and so on, leading to a lot of, of uh, visitation uh, and so on. Um, as part of their uh, park plans, uh, they wanted to expand these ski hills, but also thin out the forest in general to encourage um, certain types of vegetation. Um, at that time, um, some local people um, objected greatly uh, because of the what they thought were the effects on vegetation. Uh, but soon, this uh, involved native people who said, wait a minute, we have cemeteries up there. You know, this, is an, this is a village, and we have, we have some of our ancestors up there. Um, so uh, there was great objection to, to some of these plans, causing all kinds of trouble and controversy, and sides started to split up. And it was just uh, pretty, uh, pretty uh, egregious uh, in terms of misunderstandings, cross-cultural misunderstandings. Uh, so I was called in uh, to sort of uh, uh, tell uh, the, mostly the park w about what this ancient site was, or this older site was, and so on, as state archaeologist. Um, and uh, it was soon working with both the native people uh, in the area and the Kansas Potawatomi, whose ancestors these were, as well as the park. Uh, to, and I said, first thing we've got to figure out is, so what are we talking about? You know, where is this place? How big is it? What is it composed of? And then we can take that information and look at, look at the plans and figure out solutions. You know, so that's what, what I did uh, uh, with the help of many people. Uh, we even got a special state approach. This is so controversial that even the state legislature uh, gave us $15,000, gave the State Historical Society to help settle the matter. Um, I don't think that would happen today. I don't know. What do you think? <laughs> but the, uh, uh, and so as a result of this study, I did an awful lot of background research, including um, talking to and getting the traditions and ancestry of, of native people, um, a lot of the descendants still live in this area, you know, and an awful lot uh, are on the Kansas <laughs> reservation. So uh, it really opened up the door for a lot of information. Oral history, um, the, as you can see from this photograph, the community itself was so unusual to the local white population that everybody wanted to go see it, you know, the Indians on the hill sort of thing. And at this time, this is but 1910, but at, at this time, a, a new device was coming into common use, the camera, that is small cameras. Previous to that, you had these big studio cameras and you had a pretty, pretty much of a specialist. The first Kodaks were coming out. And so everybody was running around, snapping pictures everywhere. And of course, the people, the native people on the hill became just a huge focus of this photography. So we have hundreds of photographs from this time. Um, other people were attracted uh, to this community because of its nature. Anthropologists from the Milwaukee Public Museum, for example, went to study firsthand native traditions. Um, a guy named uh, Jirin, Alphonse Jirin, a dentist from um, Kenosha, had a special interest in the Potawatomi. He was obsessed with Potawatomi culture, published a lot of articles. He was there all the time, befriended these people, took many more pictures, described uh, 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 in detail its history, you know, and, and the history of the people that lived there. Uh, so between all of this, we have just a, a tremendous historical uh, record. Um, ultimately, I have to tell you that things turned out pretty well. Um, we ultimately put the site on the National Register of Historic Places. We mapped out specifically where 
the park should stay away from and gain the cooperation of the county uh, and the park in all these things. Um, basically, they have designated this as a sacred area, stay away, stuff like that. Uh, and so everything turned out um, uh, uh, pretty well, which I'm very pleased with. Um, and it also, because, <clears throat> because of my work, although so many people assisted, um, I was also pleased to be given a Potawatomi name by the Native Americans uh, at the time. So my Indian name is Gigaba. <laughs> you know Gigabas? <laughs> Gigabas are, uh, in the beliefs of Ojibwa and Potawatomi people, Gigabas are little spirit men <laughs> that live in the woods. They're real mischievous. You could, you could hear them laughing, you know? But the thing is, and, and so obviously this was, you know, partly a, you know, a, in reference to my character and, uh, and stature, but also, as I was told, <laughs> As I was told, um, only children could see gigabuzz. They're like little leprechauns. <laughs> but if you see one as an adult, it'll bring you good fortune. And that's what they're saying. Thank you for you know, helping to resolve this. So the point is, uh, how many can, can see me right now? <laughs> <laughs> I don't make myself visible to just anybody, if you know what I mean. <laughs> Well, more about the site then, and um, the site is, is actually located near Wisconsin Rapids. Like I said, on this Powers Bluff that had been made into uh, a park, there is a location. It's, you can visit it, and, and maybe you should sometime. Um, uh, there, are, there are some things to see that are left over from this uh, native uh, um, uh, occupation, uh, but also preserved in the area, there's a natural area. Uh, preserved by uh, Department of Natural Resources, actually pretty a park. Um, and here again, uh, people had uh, made this uh, town and to give a little bit of background here, the Potawatomi lived in southeastern Wisconsin uh, and were removed in the 1830s, ultimately to reservation in Kansas. But a lot of these people refused to go. Uh, just like a lot of Ho-Chunk people. Um, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the, the Ho-Chunk people here in Wisconsin are descendants of people who refused to be removed. <laughs> you know, a lot of their people were sent out to Nebraska, but the modern Ho-Chunk nation are descendants of resistors and who'd rather live almost landless, wandering around uh, rather than uh, go to a reservation. Same thing here, Pot, uh, the Potawatomi moved, some of the Potawatomi moved to central Wisconsin, but they maintained good relations with their kin out on the Potawatomi Reservation, which are now called the Prairie Potawatomi people. In fact, this group even became enrolled as Prairie Potawatomi on the reservation, um, which offered them some benefits, even though uh, they, they, they were marked in the tribal roles as um, living in Wisconsin. But nevertheless, they, they, they maintain close ties, uh, often annual visits, you can imagine, by horseback or wagon to Kansas, just to keep those ties. Now, in the 1870s, a new worldview, some call it a new religion appeared among native people in, um, in the upper uh, Midwest and Midwest uh, in general, even out of the Grain Plains. Um, you're all familiar with the ghost dance. You've heard of it. Well, there was another ceremonial that developed called the dream dance. And this was introduced by a female prophet, um, young woman, we, apparently, named Tail Feathered Woman who after an attack on her village um, received instructions from the supernatural, from the great spirit, that uh, said that native people must, must adopt a new view based on old traditions. One is preserving old traditions at any cost, but second of all, 
is that if people engage in a certain ritual called the dream dance itself and come together and drum from a common drum um, and live a certain way of life that all the native people will live together in peace because there had been a lot of intribal affection. The white people would notice this and also live. I mean, it was a, it was a, it was a movement of peace. Um, uh, but it emphasized traditional ways of life, but also introduced some new traditions, uh, including the ceremonial drum. Uh, up to this point, most native drumming was done with hand drums. But what this emphasized is, no, we drum together. You know, and so uh, this bigger drum was made. In fact, the Great Spirit told this tail feather woman to make it out of a old wash tub. But soon it became very elaborate, as you can see uh, right here. And this drum then was taken and her message, she walked village to village introducing this new way of life. And then people adopted it and then passed it on. It went from, she was a Sioux. And it went from the Sioux to the Ojibwa. And then from the Ojibwa to the Potawatomi, the Menominee, uh, and other tribes, uh, all engaged in this. Each time a new drum being made from bits and pieces of the old drum. Um, and today, it survives. It's called the big drum uh, in certain communities. Um, that's the drum right there. It's actually, this is a white pigeon who was the leader both of the Dream Dumb and the Skunk Hill community. Uh, and there's the drum. It actually has, it's colored. Um, on the top, it is divided into blue and red. Blue standing for north, red standing for south, and then the yellow line coming down representing the east-west direction. So it's tied into you know, sort of a, a sacred directions. Here is another picture of white pigeon uh, during one of the ceremonials at the Skunk Hill community. Now, um, as I mentioned before, the Potawatomi had been removed. Most of the Potawatomi had been removed to the uh, Kansas Reservation, which you see here, Kansas Reservation. Um, and you can also see where it says Nebraska, where the Winnebago uh, re removed. Um, a, a person named John Young. Uh, a, a Potawatomi from Wisconsin uh, had close contacts with the Potawatomi Reservation and in fact was considered to be sort of the tribal or the co tribal council member representing the Wisconsin people. And he in Wisconsin had become a devotee of, of, of uh, Tail Feather Woman and the Dream Dance. And he introduced a dream dance to the Kansas Potawatomi, uh, who enthusiastically adopted it because this was hope. This was a new hope for the people who were being repressed there. Uh, but the and the reservation officials, even some of the missionaries, thought, well, this isn't this is this isn't half bad because of the morals taught by the this new religion, that is, stay away from alcohol, you know, gambling. It, it talked about living a righteous life. So even some of the reservation officials said, well, this is a good message. But nevertheless, tr these kinds of things were illegal. And, soon, uh, and in, soon came the message that if you continue these ceremonies on the reservation, we're going to call in the U.S. Army to repress that. Yeah, it was pretty, pretty serious. So instead, uh, eventually, about 80 people uh, uh, took off from the Kansas Reservation and took a train to uh, Wisconsin. They appeared in this small community, small community called Arpen today. Can you imagine the surprise? Uh, it's very small, mostly German community, um, and all of a sudden, 80 Indians come off a train <laughs> and they asked how to get to basically Skunk Hill because this had been important in traditions. Now where did the Indians get the money? Well, as a part of the repression 
forced assimilation, um, all the reservations were divided up into sections, into plots. And each individual was given, assigned a plot. This was meant to supposedly provide Native people with the concept of private ownership. You're going to, whatever, you th whatever you're doing before, you're going to become a farmer now, <laughs> or a rancher, and you're going to own this property, you know, and sooner or later, of course, you're going to have to pay taxes on it, but we won't talk about it now. Um, and uh, so, like on the Kansas reservation, it was all divided up. Well, there are only so many people, and it turns out that the number of sections out outnumbered uh, uh, people, and so what did they do with the rest? They sold it to white farmers. And so very quickly, uh, about three quarters of all Indian reservation land was lost <laughs> to, I mean, the real, the real effort here was literally to dispossess people who had been promised reservation land forever, you know, and this is sort of a s sneaky way of doing this. Uh, so some of the native people uh, had their plots, and what they did was they simply rented them out to white farmers, you know, and uh, used the money to buy land in Wisconsin, and also to support their lives. So ironically, a system which had meant to erase native traditions actually helped support <laughs> the, the, uh, the preservation uh, of these. Just more. Uh, this is a picture of John Young, again, the individual who was responsible for introducing uh, the dream dance. Uh, John Young did not live at Skunk Hill. John Young, in fact, uh, had been establishing a series of dream dance communities in Wisconsin. Uh, his daughter, however, married into the Skunk Hill Band. The Skunk Hill Band itself, mostly Potawatomi, but other people had joined them. Uh, there are people like Ho-Chunk people uh, and other people who had married in uh, to the group. So it quickly became very cosmopolitan and it drew thousands of people occasionally. This became a ceremonial center uh, for the Dream Dance. So uh, annually, uh, people would come there for a week-long dream dance ceremonial, which included a lot of sacred ceremonies, but a lot of visiting and a lot of joyful, uh, get to, you know, sort of family reunion and so on. Um, and this drew people from all over the state, also from Kansas. I mean, people would, who had not moved, you know, had, would come out and um, for annual ceremonies, you know. Uh, by uh, bus, I mean not bus, excuse me, by um, horseback uh, and so on. Um, and other people, uh, this was sort of the height of their ceremonial uh, year and a, a very pleasurable, according to the people uh, who were still living that participated in, in that. Here are some of the other communities that John Young had uh, made. You see Skunk Hill in the center there in Wood County. Uh, but uh, his other communities, include before and during Skunk Hill, uh, were at a place called Old Plain, a place called Indian Farms, and lastly at McCord, which is in Oneida County, way up north, and where people lived, connected with the drum dance right into the 1940s. You know, people were still there uh, from that. Uh, a very, very big community included a lot of Ojibwa people too because um, the Lac do Flambeau Reservation is just north there. So a lot of people from Lac do Flambeau came for the same reason. They were being suppressed on the reservation so it was easier just to drift down uh, to this community. Um, this is just a picture of the Skunk Hill layout. One of the um, defining features are dream dance circles that is earthen circles that were made for rituals to take place. Um, and two earthen circles are, are still present at uh, Skunk Hill. Now Skunk Hill itself and these other communities started to go into demise about 1930s um, for various reasons. I mean, it was obviously the Great Depression which affected everybody. 
Um, but also, uh, there was a change, starting to change uh, federal Indian policy. Um, 1928, um, a, a special report to the uh, United States government pointed out that this whole era of forced civilization had backfired completely. It had not um, done what it promised, and in fact was greatly to the detriment. Poverty among Indians hugely increased. Most native peoples lost their uh, uh, lands, but had not become successful white farmers and stuff like that. Instead, clung to their traditional ways. And basically, it was a moralistic sta uh, statement saying, you know, how can we treat people, how can the United States treat people this way? And uh, in the wake of that, um, uh, in the, under the Roosevelt administration, um, in 1934, uh, a, a change in Indian policy offered a new deal for Native people. Uh, and all of these sources of oppression were removed. People could now practice their religion, speak their languages, uh, a, a better treatment basically uh, going on. So basically what I'm saying is that some pressures were easing that made it unnecessary to have special off-reservation uh, communities. So after a time, um, these uh, dissipated. This is a beaded band that was worn by White Pigeon, the leader of this community that I showed you before. Um, White Pigeon died uh, in the late 1920s. Um, but uh, during his life, uh, uh, apparently he had worn this ceremonial band around his neck. Uh, after he died, uh, some people uh, at the uh, community um, traded uh, this band and some other things for some goods from a nearby farmer. And uh, that farming family named the Hamels kept this in their possession. And this is a recent photograph. Um, I've been in touch with Lyle Hamill, who was born on the farm right next to Skunk Hill, to get information about the people that live there. And he sent me pictures uh, of this. And in the meanwhile, uh, over the last several years, he's actually returned this material to Potawatomi descendants. So these are, are, are in the hands of Potawatomi descendants as we speak. Um, one of those who has the beaded band right now <clears throat> is named Art Shigoni, who is, everybody knows Art, yeah, he's, yeah, he does it, um, dance interpretations and so on around there. Um, and, and coincidentally, why I was um, uh, tracking down um, the, the beaded band um, from Lyle, I was going to ask him, um, exactly to do that, but, uh, but in the meanwhile, sort of cross communication, Art, who lives about a mile from my house, had the ban. <laughs> He's doing all this research and it was right here uh, in Madison. But I just wanted to point out lastly, and I'm going to end here, this, the uh, symbolism involved there. Um, what you see there is a central butterfly and on the wings a cross. And this cross symbolism goes back thousands of years, and is, is a symbol of the earth, a circle with a cross, and the cross represents the four sacred directions. So this is an earth symbol, butterfly carrying the earth, and it is surrounded by birds, four-tailed birds, carrying something in its mouth. Um, it could, could be a worm or something like that, but this is, uh, this is in the 20th century, remember, um, and this recalls sort of the idea of the, uh, of the bird, the dove carrying the branch, the peace symbol. So what we, we're looking at probably is emerging in symbolism of native and non-native, but saying one message, and that we must all live together in peace. So that's the synopsis of the book, and uh, I, of, course, of course, had to eliminate a lot of detail, but I hope that you'll buy the book and, and enjoy it as much as I did writing it. Thank you. <laughs>